Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the lecture for today. I hope you're all safe and healthy out there and getting through the stay-at-home order. Um, today we're going to be talking about the uh, gala, the sorry, the icy moons of the outer solar system. Uh, we'll be focusing a little bit on the moons of Jupiter um, today, but a lot of this applies to some of the other moons in the solar system as well. So, uh, let's go ahead and begin. So here you can see some the, the moons of the outer solar system. Now this isn't all of them. There are um, hundreds of moons, uh, at least 150 or 200. Uh, these are just some of the largest, most important ones. So these four at the top are called the Galilean moons these four right here. Now, those are the four largest moons of Jupiter, and they were discovered by Galileo in 1610. Uh, if you remember back to when we talked about uh, the heliocentric versus the geocentric model of the solar system, uh, it was uh, his observation of these moons was some of the first strong uh, evidence uh, for the heliocentric model, um, seeing them orbit around something other than the Earth. Now, Jupiter has uh, 79 known moons uh, besides these four, but most are small um, tiny moons. Uh, probably uh, potato-shaped. Uh, that is in there, not round. In order for a moon to be round, it needs to be bigger than about 500 kilometers, at least for these icy moons. So most of these moons, um, with the exception of uh, Io, uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, are mostly composed of ice. Maybe, maybe, maybe not mostly, but at least 50% ice, 50% rock. They have a rocky core at the center um, covered by maybe a liquid ocean in some cases, and then a thin layer of ice over the top of that. Uh, Callisto may be a rock and ice that may not be differentiated. That material still may be uh, mixed up inside. Okay, uh, down below that, you can see the moons of Saturn. Um, Titan has most of the mass of Saturn's moons. Uh, you can see even in this picture, it's much, much larger. It's the only moon in the solar system with an atmosphere. Uh, and Saturn also has many, many time, tiny moons. Also many tiny moons. Uh, it looks like it has probably 82 known moons. Now, some of those moons are uh, embedded within Saturn's rings, and they may only be temporarily uh, moonlets and that they form as ring particles collide. And then as the rings tug and pull on those uh, temporary moon aggregations, they break apart. So um, it's really hard to say exactly at any given time how many moons Saturn has. Um, but we're mostly going to focus on Titan and maybe Enceladus. You can see that uh, right down here on the... Uh, right there. So, um, Neptune, we're not going to talk much about, uh, or sorry, Uranus, uh, we're not really going to talk much about those moons. Um, there's really not much going on as far as astrobiology there that we can tell. Um, the same with Neptune. These are getting pretty far from the sun. Uh, Uranus and Neptune don't quite have as much gravity to pull on their moons, so they're not exciting. Uh, we'll talk about the effect of the gravitational pull from the planet in a bit. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out here with Neptune's moon Triton, that this is likely a captured, captured 
Kuiper Belt object. Uh, remember those KBOs we talked about? Um, uh, Pluto is a KBO. So it's uh, fairly large and round, so that's un unusual. Most captured moons are um, small, uh, oddly shaped things. Now, this I want to draw your attention to this last box down here on the bottom. Uh, these are to scale uh, the moon. Um, at this Earth's moon in the middle here, uh, Mercury and Pluto. You can see that um, many, if not uh, most of these moons we're looking at here are larger than Pluto. And a few of them, Titan and Ganymede, are actually larger than the planet Mercury. So that's pretty amazing. Ganymede and Titan are larger than Mercury. So even though these things are moons, they're um, bigger than some of the things we call planets in our own solar system, or I should say maybe have called planets in the past. So that's just a quick tour of these objects. And now we're going to focus um, on the Jovian moons, and um, we will talk uh, a little bit about some of the dynamics that goes on with them. So let's take a break for a second. Oh, sorry, before we do that, um, I did want to point out that these Jovian moons, um, the, the Galilean moons, well, really all of the these large moons, uh, we can make an observation about them and that they have the same rotational direction um, in that they orbit their planets in the same direction that they rotate. Now we've seen this before where the rotation of the planets is in the same direction that they orbit the sun. And so we saw this in the nebular theory of planet formation. And so you can see this picture down here showing the solar nebula with planetesimals forming around it. And this would have been maybe about 10 to 20 million years after the sun uh, formed. Uh, we see, if we zoom in up here on this little box, we see a young Jupiter. And that Jupiter has a disk of gas and dust around it. And so we think that these uh, largest moons formed in a disk of gas and dust, just like the planets formed. And uh, so I like to think of these things as being little mini solar systems in their own right. Now we see some of the other moons um, there, especially the smaller ones are in inclined orbits where they don't orbit in the plane of the planet in the equatorial plane. And they also often are rotating backwards. Remember retrograde means backwards. And so um, this indicates that many of these small moons with these funny orbits are likely captured objects. And so that's how we know that some formed in place and some were captured. Uh, and it's a really nice extension of this nebular theory that we talked about earlier in the semester. And on a side note, this is exactly what I got my PhD dissertation on, uh, or did my PhD dissertation on, was these um, disks of gas around planets out of which their moons formed. So uh, it's got a soft spot in my heart. All right, so let's talk about the dynamics of some of these things. We'll take a step back real quick and think about our own moon. Let's think about how often does the moon rotate. So please push pause and think about this for a moment on your own. Well, it turns out that it rotates once a month. We call this synch synchronous 
rotation. That is where the orbit and rotation take the same amount of time. And we'll look at this a little bit on the next slide. Okay, and one thing I like to remember is that I like to remember that the word month comes from the word moon by pronouncing it month. So I would say that the moon rotates once a month and it orbits the earth once a month. Uh, just a little easy way to remember that. All right, so here's a little uh, exercise I want you to do at home here. And so if you want to push pause and gather some materials together, uh, this will work well if you have a pen or a pencil, a small piece of paper, or even a sticky note. And um, go ahead and draw a face on that sticky note. All right, once you have all your materials uh, gathered up, what I want you to do is to take your pen or your pencil and go ahead and tape your piece of paper right on there. And then what you're gonna do is hold that out at arm's length so you can see the face that you drew on there. Oops, we should give you a head. And then what you're gonna do is take that moon that's facing you and rotate your body and or your arm around in a circle so that the moon orbits your head. So what we're thinking about here is that we make this observation that we always see the same side of the moon. And so I want you to try this, try letting the moon orbit around your head and see See if you can answer the question, does the moon need to rotate in order for you to see the same face at all times throughout the orbit? So go ahead and play with that a bit. See what you can come up with as an answer. Does the moon have to rotate as it goes around? Now I gave you the answer in the previous slide. So we know that the answer is yes once an orbit, or once a month. So, um, one way to help you see this, if you're having trouble uh, seeing this with your homemade moon, is to keep the face of the moon pointed at one wall in the room as it orbits around your body. Now, if the moon is not rotating, then if it's facing the wall and behind you when you start with your arm out in front of you, as you rotate that arm behind you, it should still be facing that wall that's behind you. So keep it facing the same direction all the time. And like I said, what you should find out is that after a half of an orbit, when that um, moon has gone around halfway, the face should now be facing away from you. So, so you're not confused. This is with no rotation. That's what we would see. And so if no rotation causes the wrong side to face you, because again, remember, we always see the same side of the moon, so we have to figure out how that moon rotates. We know that this is incorrect, and it must rotate. Okay? Just a little something to play with on your own. All right, let's keep going. So why did we talk about that synchronous rotation? It's because it's an observable effect of the strong interactions of the tides. So synchronous 
rotation shows that the tides have a big effect on moons. And that's going to be an important theme for today. So let's think a little bit about um, some tides here. So this line here that extends right between the Earth and the moon, we call that the Earth-Moon line. Okay, and so what happens here with tides is that when everything is lined up like this, where the Earth and the Moon are lined up with what happens, well, I mean, this always happens, but along this line, gravity pulls unevenly on the planet and the Moon, this creates a stretched tidal bulge on either side of the moon and the planet along the Earth-Moon line. So you can see that tidal bulge over here on the Earth. And it's not shown here because it's very, very small. So this is very apparent on Earth because we have the oceans. And the oceans are liquid and so they move around very easily. But this also happens to the crust and the mantle and the whole object. And so the moon also has very tiny tidal bullet bulges happening here. So very slight but important bulge here too. Okay, so because of that alignment, we end up with this bulge. And then what happens, uh, what can happen, so we have two effects here, synchronous rotation, that I will explain in a second. But first, I'm going to do that with this picture where we talk about another effect where, whoops, where we can see that talking about here where Earth is slowing its rotation. So Earth is slowing down. This would eventually cause us to become synchronously rotating with the moon, um, but it also increases the moon's orbital distance. So here we have an interaction where we are uh, slowing Earth's rotation down because of the alignment and also um, pushing the moon a little bit farther away. So we're exchanging uh, energy and angular momentum here. So what the effect is, is that because of the friction with the oceans, uh, the bulge here ends up slightly ahead of the Earth-Moon line. You can see that it leads it a little bit, but now it's being pulled back in the other direction. And so the Moon pulling on the misalignment of this bulge slows Earth's rotation down. It pulls it back this way, and it has to get that energy some, from somewhere, so it pulls um, energy out of the moon, which actually makes it go farther and farther away. Okay? So, if Earth wasn't rotating at all, or if it was in a synchronous rotation, whoops, thought that was my highlighter, um, if Earth didn't rotate, uh, these would always be lined up. And that's what happens with the moon, um, is the moon, because the same face is always facing us, that tidal bulge is always lined up. So uh, this, geez, I'm sorry, I keep using the wrong pen here. This effect effect will eventually 
cause Earth to synchronous synchronously rotate with the moon or it will line up. So again, we've shown you this with the Earth because the oceans make this easy to see and we're all familiar with the tides going up and down here on the Earth. Now this exact same process is happening here on the moon. It, it had a tidal bulge. At one point it was rotating at the different speed and it was eventually slowed down such that um, it is now always lined up with the Earth. So this is a natural result, and by this I mean synchronous rotation is a natural result of tidal interactions between two bodies. So we see that happening uh, quite often, not just for the Earth and the Moon, but also um, for all of the moons. It turns out that most of these large moons of Jupiter and Saturn are also synchronously rotating. Um, yeah. So... Let's move on here. Here's another question for you. So we see that the Galilean moons um, are hot on the inside. We see signs of internal heat. Uh, that is the very active volcanoes on Io and likely oceans on Europa. So what is the source of this heat? And I'll let you think about that quietly on your own for a moment. All right, so it turns out that the correct answer here is that it's these tidal interactions we've just been talking about. That's one reason we've spent so much time on them is because these tidal interactions can provide a bunch of heat. Uh, it can melt the ice. Remember I said that these moons are mostly 50%, if not more, water ice. And so having all this heat will give us liquid water, which is then... Um, a necessary ingredient for life, as far as we know. So I will say that um, B also contributes. So anyone who answers that was on the right track, um, but uh, D is the main contributor to this heat. So let's look at a couple of these interactions real quick before we go. So uh, one of the main ones here is that these things are in elliptical orbits. Now we mentioned how all the planets are in elliptical orbits, but these orbits are especially elliptical. And so that means uh, there's a big difference. Sometimes the moon, in this case Io is shown, is closer and sometimes it's much farther away. You can see that clearly in this picture, this distance here versus this distance here. And so when we're closer, remember gravity equals g m m over r squared. If r changes, this force changes. So if r is smaller r, we get a bigger F, G, the force of gravity is stronger, and so these tidal bulges are going to be um, bigger when we're closer. And vice versa, when we're further away, the force of gravity is smaller, and we get smaller tidal bulges. And so this effect is essentially like bending and pulling this is like uh, pulling and squishing Silly Putty. I don't know how many of you have played with Silly Putty, but I've done it quite a number of times. And if you work that Silly Putty in your hands for a little while, pulling it out, squeezing it together, pulling it out, it warms up. And so it's essentially the same idea here, that bending and pulling of the material of the moon, the rocks and the ice that are there, uh, eventually that gets turned into uh, heat energy. So we're turning orbital energy here into thermal energy. The other effect over here 
uh, shown in this picture on the right are what we call resonant interactions. And here, what you can see, or what you need to see here is that, um, so we talked about Kepler's laws and how planets that are closer to the sun um, go around faster than planets that are farther away. That was Kepler's third law, p squared equals a cubed. And so Kepler's laws also apply to these moons. And so the innermost moon, Io, goes around much faster than Europa, which goes around faster than Ganymede. And it turns out that Io goes around four times every time Europa goes around twice, which is every time Ganymede goes around once. And so every so often, these moons all line up in a row. And when they all line up, the gravity that's bending and stretching of them gets stronger. Because it's not just one of them pulling on it, or they're not all pulling in different directions. If they're all pulling in the same direction, they pull harder. And so what we would call this is a 4 to 2 to 1 resonance. And um, again, it ends up um, pulling and squishing and warming it up like silly putty. So these resonances aren't just a coincidence. We think that the moons probably migrated around. We talked about planet migration. It turns out when planets and moons migrate, they tend to capture each other in resonances. Uh, it's a little bit... Um, and a little bit, uh, well, I don't know what it's like, but we call this shepherding. And we see this a lot in uh, the rings of Saturn. So if you look at the rings of Saturn, there's things like the Cassini gap. And there's lots of structure in Saturn's rings, little gaps and stuff. Uh, those are all driven by resonances with the moons either outside of the rings or the moons embedded within the rings. And so... Uh, the Cassini spacecraft that it is Saturn right now uh, is doing, well, sorry, it it just passed away and crashed into Saturn last year, uh, but it did a wonderful job for about 15 years of studying um, many of the resonances in Saturn's rings. It's very beautiful laboratory for this kind of thing. All right, so uh, that's it for today. Uh, we did a quick tour of the moons of the outer solar system. Uh, we talked about tides, because tides are where these moons get their heat. Uh, as it says on this slide, the energy for life. Uh, we need to melt the moons. They're, they're at least half ice. If we can melt that ice and get water, um, we can uh, find life, hopefully. That's the, the plan anyway. So I, I will maybe end with the idea that this was a very, very unexpected result. Uh, when NASA first sent their spacecraft out to this part of the solar system, we expected these moons to be dead, lifeless worlds, uh, like our own moon, except for made of ice. We expected them to be covered in craters. We expected their surfaces to be frozen and dead and very, very old. And so when we got there and found that these surfaces were active surfaces, there's lots of um, geologic features on them, very recent geologic features, uh, active geology in terms of Io. Um, even the other moons have not geology, but cryovolcanism, icy volcanoes, things like that. Um, all of this stuff was completely unexpected. Uh, no scientist before um, uh, the, the NASA missions would have uh, predicted this. So, um, yeah, very neat, interesting results and a lot of possibility when it comes to astrobiology. All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful day and stay safe out there.